Boutros, are you going to be taking this witness? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. <clears throat> Your Honor, plaintiffs call Professor Nancy Cott. Very well. Ms. Cott. Would you raise, take the stand? Is your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Very well. Please be seated. State your name and spell your last name for the record. Nancy F. Cott, C-O-T-T. -T. And be sure that you keep your voice up. So maybe you can move that microphone a Fine. little closer. How's this? Well, we'll see. <laughs> Good afternoon, Professor Cott. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like you to give us a brief description of your academic and professional background. And before I do, um, we've, we've handed you a binder of, of the exhibits. And if you could turn to um, the penalty test of 2323, which is the last document in the, in the binder. Could you tell me if you recognize that document? Yes, it's my CV. Your Honor, I, I would move uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2323 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Yeah, yes, we have a, a final uh, may I approach, Your Honor. You may, of course. All the exhibits I may refer to. Thank you. All right, there's no objection to 2023, I believe. 2323, uh, Your Honor. I beg your pardon, 2323. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Thank, thank you. Um, 2323? Yes. At the end. Perhaps you can furnish the court an updated exhibit list. Yep. We stopped at uh, 2320. Ye yes, Your Honor. In fact, I thought uh, 2320 exhibits was enough. <laughs> 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 we kept going. This, this was act actually part of uh, exhibit 1306 which we're not going to use, and we broke it out, and I consulted with counsel on the other side. I should have explained that, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. 23, or 20, 2323 is admitted. Thank you. Professor Cott, could you give us uh, a brief description of your academic background? Yes. I gained my PhD in the history of American civilization in 1974, and shortly after that, I began teaching in the Departments of History and American Studies at Yale University. And I remained there, moving up through the ranks. Of, I remained there for 26 years, teaching in those fields, specializing in the history of women, gender, the family, marriage, and related social and cultural and political topics. And in uh, 2002, Two, at which point I was a Sterling Professor of History and American Studies at Yale, which is the highest faculty honor the university gives. I moved to Harvard University, where I remain. I am the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History, and I'm also the faculty director of the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America as part of my responsibilities there. I continue teaching in the same fields. Are you a historian? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and have you published any books, Professor Cott? Yes, I've published uh, eight books. And has the history of marriage in the United States been a research area of yours uh, during your career as a historian? It has. Some of my earlier books in the 1970s and 80s dealt with questions about marriage, but my main um, period of research on the history of marriage was during the 
decade of the 1990s, and as a result of which I wrote and published the book Public Vows, A History of Marriage and the Nation. And I also published uh, an article which dealt with materials that I decided not to include in the book uh, in the American Historical Review, which is the leading journal in the historical field. Uh, I, this article dealt with marriage and women's citizenship. What, what is your current position at Harvard? I'm the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History. And um, when did you first start investigating the history of marriage in the United States? It was uh, around 1990. I, uh, I decided I wanted to look at the history of marriage from an angle which I thought other American historians had neglected, and that was the history of marriage as a public institution, uh, a structure created by governments for individuals and for social benefit. And insofar as historians had dealt with the history of marriage, typically they had tried to examine and look at change over time in the way married individuals experienced the institution. And I thought that the, uh, this other angle was neglected, and that's what I began to research. While you were at Yale, did you teach any classes on the history of marriage? Well, many of my courses that dealt with the history of women and the family uh, touched upon marriage, but in the, while I was in the process of researching this book, I received a special honor from the president of Yale University, which was to be appointed as the Devane Professor. This is a temporary appointment that one faculty member per year is given to teach a course of his or her own choosing that's outside the regular structure of the departments and can be interdisciplinary or unusual. And because I was coming to um, some conclusions and I had a great deal of evidence and research about the history of marriage at that time, it was 1997 when I got this request or honor, uh, I, I said I would teach a course on the history of marriage in the United States over two centuries, and I did teach that course in 1998. And were you able to devote your, all of your teaching that year to that, that entire one semester? Not, not the entire year, but that Thank entire you. semester. Uh, Professor Cott, I would like you to turn to uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1746 in, in the uh, exhibit booklet. In numerical order, yes. C1750, oh, here we are. Oh, <laughs> I recognize this. <laughs> recognize the cover of, yes. cover of your book. It I'll is give the cover the of my book, Public <laughs> Vows, yes. And, and if we could put that up on the screen. Um, you called your book Public Vows, A History of Marriage uh, and the Nation. Why did you call your book, why did you title your book Public Vows? Well, I've made somewhat of a specialty of having my book titles have a, a kind of double meaning, <laughs> and I, I did so this time in that uh, I meant by public vows to express two aspects of marriage as a public institution, two related aspects. One is simply that the couple, in taking their marriage vows, makes them publicly before a witness, and that is part of the, the, um, the, the formalization of a valid marriage. But in addition to that, I was struck through my research at the extent to which marriage was an institution, uh, was the institution that we know it as, because the public, in the form of the state, is making certain vows to the couple about the protection and support of their relationship in granting them a valid marriage. And what I was examining uh, far more in the book uh, than a couple's intents, uh, any individual private couple's intents, was what the public intentions in the institution of marriage had been over time. In what year was your book published? Uh, it was published in the year 2000. 
how long did you spend researching and conducting your work uh, in, in, Ab as you about a book? decade about a decade wait for counsel to finish his question thank you <laughs> yeah professor Khan the could you give provide us with a, an overview of the 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 subject of your book, Public Vows? Well, I, uh, as I've said, I wanted to emphasize the public side of marriage. And one of the themes that became very apparent to me and that goes throughout the book and now characterizes my views on marriage is what a capacious institution it is. Uh, it is a unique institution, of course, uh, but one of the things that particularly characterizes it is the way it encompasses uh, aspects that in other uh, settings we think of as opposites. And the public nature of marriage is very much one of those. That is, marriage is both a public and a private institution. Most people who consider marrying think principally about the private matter. Have they found a partner they love? Do they want to join in this, in this intimate relationship, which is ideally to last for life? It is also the foundation of the private realm of um, family creation, property transmission, and what we think of as the private when we contrast it with the public. On the other hand, it is uh, by its very definition a public institution that the state has authorized and uh, uses to regulate the population and that the public uh, in, the, in the state, through the state and the law, uh, dispenses certain benefits through. This public-private hybrid that marriage is, um, is unique. And there are other seemingly contradictory or, or paradoxical uh, characteristics to the institution that I stressed as the theme of my book. One quite related to its public uh, aspects is the way that marriage has, through our history, had a, a very strong governance function at the same time that it um, is characterized by liberty. It, uh, marriage is only possible for individuals who can exercise the liberty uh, value of our citizens. And it has also been, uh, particularly in the 20th century, the realm created by marriage, that private realm, has been repeatedly reiterated as a, um, as a realm of liberty uh, for intimacy and um, uh, free decision making by the parties in that private realm. In forming your opinions in this case, the Perry case, did you rely on the work you, you did for a decade? And, in preparing and writing your book? Yes, that is the principal um, body of research and thinking that I've relied on in, in my thinking about marriage for this case. And since your, your book was published in 2000, have there been other materials that you are relying on in, in the opinions that you have developed in this case uh, that have emerged since you published your book in 2000? Yes, I think that this area has produced other scholarships since then, uh, mostly uh, developing areas that I did not touch on in great detail. And I continue to update my, my own uh, knowledge in that area. And so in writing my report for this case, I did rely on other uh, uh, books and articles as well. Your Honor, we tender Professor caught as an expert on the subject of the history of marriage in the United States. Very well, voir dire. We have no objection, Your Honor, to her being qualified as an expert on that subject. Very well, and thank you, sir. You may proceed, Mr. Boutrous. Thank you, Your Honor. First, Professor Cott, I'd like to ask you, has, over the, the history of our nation, marriage played a central, vital role in American society? Yes, I think there's uh, no doubt about that. As a historian, perhaps you could, you could help us understand a little bit better um, what you, as a historian, are talking about when you talk about the concept of marriage. Yes, well, marriage 
in our setting is a very particular form of the institution. Human cultures in different places and over time have uh, formulated many different forms of, what, uh, of the marriage institution. Ours um, is uh, relatively recent in human culture and it, it, it has its own distinctive antecedents uh, in the Anglo-American common law. To think of marriage as um, a universal institution, the same around the globe, is it seems to me inaccurate. Um, if I around the globe. I specifically asked her in her deposition whether she was an expert uh, in history outside the United States, and she said no. Boutrous? Professor Cott, in forming your opinions and in conducting your work and research and evaluating the institution of marriage in the United States, did you evaluate and look at the history of marriage that preceded the formation of the United States around the world? I did, and let me comment on that from inside well, well, U.S. That, the history. The answer is yes. What's your next <laughs> yes. question? Yes. And yes. <laughs> was your evaluation of the uh, systems of marriage uh, throughout uh, civilized history, uh, did that play an important part in your work in, in writing the book Public Vows and in forming your opinions about the history of marriage in the United States? Well, I'd like to answer that from inside American history and some of the awarenesses and um, sensitivities of the founders of the United States at the time of the American Why Revolution. Why don't you just answer yes or no? I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> right. Yes, yes or no, and then he, he, believe me, he'll go on to the next one. <laughs> Thank you, Your I'm, Honor, for prompting I'm me. I'm ready. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, Your Honor, I would ask that the objection be overruled. Your Honor, if the court would like, I can pull up on the screen the portion of the deposition testimony where I said, do you, cons you don't consider yourself an expert in the history of marriage in countries outside the United States. Is that right? That is right. And now she's being offered to and, and asked to speak about the history of marriage around the world and whether it's a universal institution. There's nothing of that in her report, so this would violate Rule 26. And she's her, she herself has admitted she's not an expert in this subject. So I understood the questions of the witness it elicited that to inform her view of the history of marriage in the United States, she did make some comparisons with the institution of marriage in other societies and other countries and other civilizations. And I think that's an appropriate uh, subject for her testimony. But I would agree with you that she is not qualified as an expert on marriage generally, marriage around the world. So with that limitation, Mr. Boutrous, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. The, the, and, and let me just go back and clarify. In, in, in uh, conducting your work in evaluating the history of marriage in the United States, did you compare the institution uh, of marriage in the United States with the uh, institution of marriage in other nations and other civilizations? And, I, and as the court I, suggested, I, yeah, not, if you not could. literally, not literally. I would like to clarify what I did do, if I may. Please clarify what you did do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, began my book by focusing on the place of marriage in the views of the founders of the American Republic, and they were very much aware of what a minority in among all the peoples of the globe their form of marriage constituted. They were very aware that most of the peoples in the globe at that time practiced polygamy or group marriage or as they saw among Native Americans, uh, other forms of marriage quite different from their own. And in fact, that was one of the great discoveries of uh, colonization and um, exploration by Europeans and British people of the rest of the globe that forms of marriage were so various uh, 
in, in other cultures and among other peoples. So that simply from my expertise in American history makes me very aware that there have been many forms of marriage that have been qualified and sanctioned by the societies that have invented them. Thank you. Yeah, when you speak of marriage as a historian, do you speak of it as a civil institution? Well, I am in talking about our, uh, yes, uh, I should say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now you may clarify. <laughs> Can you explain that further? <laughs> In, let, me, let me rephrase that. Um, um, in what manner is the institution of marriage in the United States historically been deemed a civil matter as opposed to a religious matter or some other type of entity? This, this has been characteristic in, in all the states of our nation since their founding, that the civil law has been supreme in defining and regulating marriage even while most of the people involved in writing these laws uh, were, uh, found no objection to religious ceremonies, they felt that marriage was uh, a civil matter. So much of it had to do with property and inheritance and um, the economy, things that the civil law was principally concerned with. And uh, in all the American states, uh, at the founding of the nation and then continuingly, the civil law has controlled marriage. But um, in, in your evaluation from a historical perspective, what role has religion played in the institution of marriage in the United States? Religion has uh, been in the background of many, perhaps most Americans understanding of marriage and has influenced their own practices, whether sacramental or otherwise, and often their ceremonial practices. That's been extremely common. Uh, but these are apart from and have no particular bearing on the validity of marriages. Any clerics, ministers, rabbis, etc., that were accustomed to seeing performing marriages only do so because the state has given them the authority to do that, and they do that as the delegate of the state. When California entered the union as a state, did uh, its government address uh, the issue of ensuring separation between religion and religious marriage and civil marriage in this state? Yes. How did, it, how did California address that issue? There was a clause in the first constitution that specifically said that no religious forms could, uh, no religious disagreements with a particular marriage could invalidate that marriage. Did, in your view, did the colonists, when this nation was, was first in, colonized, did they view the institution of marriage as an important one? Yes. Did they? move to uh, adopt marriage in their colonies? Yes, every single colony did. Now, um, you were here this morning when, several, when two of the um, ads were played during the testimony of the plaintiffs, correct? Yes. And did you note that in, in one of the ads, um, one of the people speaking mentioned th that, that biblical marriage it should be the the goal as opposed to marriage between individuals of the same gender. Objection, Your Honor, under Rule 26, there's no mention of this, uh, of the analysis of the ads. It's not a material she considered in either her opening report or her rebuttal report, and I did not have an opportunity to pose her about her views of the ads. Well, I think the witness just said that she was here in the courtroom and she heard those, and I think she can, she's been uh, qualified to opine on the subject of the history of marriage in the United States. Let's see where this goes. We'll see what the, see what the um, testimony is and how much weight to give it, if any. You, you were, were you here and, and yes, saw that? Yes, I was here and I saw that, yes. Um, Your Honor, I had a demonstrative prepared based on Mr. Cooper's testimony that simply tracks what he said 
with the court's permission, I'd like to have that. Cooper's testimony? Mr. Cooper's opening statement, I'm sorry. Um, and would like to display that on the screen with the court's permission. Very well. Um, if we could have proponents uh, position one displayed, please. And while that's happening, um, Professor Cott, let me ask you this. When you hear the term biblical marriage, as a historian, what does that mean to you? Well, I, to be honest, I, I had never seen this ad before this morning, and when I heard it, I thought it was really quite amusing because the Bible uh, it, it is a situation with characters that are practicing polygamy, uh, as was true in the, in the ancient world among the Jews. So uh, I was very surprised to hear him endorsing this. <laughs> and, and we have on the screen um, one of the things that Mr. Cooper said during his opening statement, and that is the limitation of marriage to a man and woman is something that has been universal. It has been across history, across customs, across society. Um, is, is that, it, do you agree with that statement? Objection leading and beyond the scope of her expertise, which is limited to the United States. Well, I think we've allowed the witness to testify as to her understanding uh, of other, inst other foreign institutions as they've informed her evaluation of American uh, marriage, and so I think that uh, question is probably okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I think this is inaccurate. Why do you believe it's inaccurate? Because of my knowledge of the existence of many forms that are not a man and a woman. Could you give the court an, an example? Certainly the examples of polygamous marriage that have been um, sanctioned in, um, well, take ancient Judaism, take um, uh, Muslim cultures uh, still today. Uh, it's, it's fairly clear, I think, to anyone who has looked at all at world history that this is not um, an accurate statement. Now in the United States, we have a tradition of, and, and the laws re require uh, monogamy. Where did that uh, tradition and that legal structure arise from as a historical matter? I uh, believe that monogamy is attributable to Christianity, and that is probably why the person in the ad said uh, biblical, because he was thinking of the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And uh, it is a tribute to uh, the success of Christian uh, evangelism, particularly after the 18th century, that there has been uh, so much move around the globe toward monogamous union uh, as compared to polygamy. Professor Cotton, let me ask you this. Um, historically, in the United States, has there developed a social meaning of marriage? Yes. And, and by the f phrase social meaning of marriage, what, what do you as a historian uh, understand that to mean? I would take that to be an, another way of saying the, the societal evaluation or understanding of marriage, which is compounded of all the population's individualized view of marriage uh, so that it is a, um, it's an amorphous uh, item to talk about the social meaning of marriage, but I think we do make generalizations uh, of this sort about common understandings, and, and that's how I would see social meaning, what, what social, the social meaning of marriage would express, the common understanding of it. Could you tell me your view, your opinion as a historian, um, what, uh, the social meaning of marriage in the United States is? Do you mean today or over as it, time? As it has developed over time and the features that have developed over time through history to form what we now think of as the institution of marriage. Well, first I would want to say that marriage is unique in some of the ways I alluded to before in its uh, paradoxical aspects that it combines successfully. It is a unique institution as a, val a, a, a valuation of a 
couple's choice to uh, live with each other, to remain committed to one another, and to form a household based on their own feelings about one another and their um, agreement to join in an economic partnership and support one another in terms of the material needs of life. So marriage places a unique valuation on such couples' choices, and that is the, the core of its social meaning. And upon that core, very many cultural um, uh, add-ons have, have been admitted as well, which I want to mention, but before talking about the cultural uh, aspects of marriage, and um, cultural advertisements for marriage, one might say, I, I should mention first, really, certain features of it which I emphasized in my book and which I think are far less obvious to people when they think about marriage. Because most people think about marriage in terms of an intimate choice. Could you tell me about, uh, give me a couple examples of those features. Yeah. Well, first of all, marriage, the, the ability to marry, to say I do, it is, is a basic civil right. Uh, it expresses the right of a person uh, to have the liberty to be able to consent validly. And this can be seen very strikingly in American history through the fact that slaves during the period, the long period that American uh, states had slavery, slaves could not marry legally. Why, why were slaves barred from marrying? Because as unfree persons, they could not consent. They, did, they lacked that very basic liberty of person, control over their own actions, that enabled them to say, I do, with the force that I do has to have, which is to say, I am accepting the state's terms for what a valid marriage is. A slave couldn't do that because the master had overall rights over the slave's ability to disport his person or to make any claim. The slave could not obligate himself in the way that a marriage partner does obligate himself or herself. What happened when slaves were emancipated? When slaves were emancipated, they flocked to get married. And this was not trivial to them by any means. They saw the ability to marry legally to replace the informal unions in which they had formed families and had children, many of them, to replace those informal unions with legal valid marriage in which the states in which they lived would presumably protect their vows to each other. Uh, in fact, one quote that historians have drawn out from the record uh, because many of these ex-slaves were illiterate, of course, but one quotation that is the title of an article a historian wrote is, it was said by an ex-slave who had also been a Union soldier, and he declared, the marriage covenant is the foundation of all our rights, meaning that it was the most everyday exhibit of the fact that, that he was a free person. He could say, I do, to his partner. And then in corollary with that, because, of course, the history of slavery is happily behind us. <laughs> um, there are other ways in which this possession of civil rights, of basic citizenship, um, is a feature of the ability to marry and to choose the partner you want to choose. What would be an example of another one of those features? Well, I, I want to use an example of that that, again, comes from the period while slavery still existed, but it doesn't have to do with a slave. It has to do with a black man, Dred Scott, who tried to say when he was in a non-slave-holding state that he was a citizen. And in an infamous decision, the Supreme Court denied him that, that um, claim. And why this is relevant here is that Justice Taney spent about three paragraphs of that opinion remarking that the fact that Dred Scott, as a black man, could not marry a white woman, in other words, that there were marriage laws in the state where he was and many other states that prevented blacks from marrying whites, was a stigma 
that marked him as less than a full citizen. Because if he had had free choice, that would be, he, Tawny wouldn't have mentioned it. Uh, but he, he remarked on it because of the extent to which this limitation on Dredd's ability to marry was a, a piece of evidence that Justice Tawney was remarking upon in his opinion to say this shows he could not be a full citizen. Yeah, going back to the era of slavery, um, w would slaves form thing, something they would call marriage or that, that the slave owners would call marriage, at least informally? Yes. And, and was that viewed by the state or by society as um, an, an important relationship? Certainly it was regarded as an important relationship within slave communities. They were the only relationships they had, these informal relationships. But they were totally treated with abandon by white society, broken up all the time, and no, no state um, authorities gave any protection or credence to these relationships whatsoever. And, and as a historical matter, to what do you attribute the, the, the desire to be formally married by the state upon emancipation? Well, it was, uh, as I suggested, because this was a common sense indication of freedom, uh, of possessing basic civil rights, and because they assumed it would mean to them that um, white uh, employers because, of course, the ex-slaves were still quite poor and employed by white, whites who were, um, well, at any rate. <laughs> um, white employers would often uh, try to demand that families worked in certain ways or that children worked and so on. And, and so the emancipated, the freed men and women, assumed that once they were legally married that they could make valid claims about their family rights. And you mentioned a little earlier that, that some of these um, values and, and the things that go into the social meaning of marriage are less visible to some. What, what did you mean by that? Well, I think this was true of myself until, until I started to do this research, and I think it's true of the vast majority of people who have no apparent limitations on their marriage rights because the person they choose is someone who is, you know, perfectly fine for them to marry. And I think people remain unaware that in marrying, one is exercising a right of freedom. As I said, most people think of it as a private choice. Do I marry or don't I? Uh, they don't tend to articulate this, this, the citizenship, the civil rights aspect of it. It's only those, and I've seen this in my book in, in various instances with various ethnic groups, racial groups, and so on. It's only those who cannot marry the partner of their choice, who, or who cannot marry at all, who are aware of the extent to which this is, that the ability to marry is an expression of one's freedom and, and the, being the bearer of, of basic civil rights. And in your view as a historical matter, um, have these effort, have efforts by individuals to acquire the right to marry um, s strengthened or weakened the institution of marriage and how it's viewed in society? Uh, do, you, do you mean individuals like emancipated slaves? I'm, I'm not sure what um, you mean. When, let, me, let me put it a different way. Um, do you believe that when, uh, as in this case, when individuals are fighting for the right to marry and there's a debate about that, um, how does that affect um, the way society talks about and views the institution of marriage? I see. I see. You were referring to those groups I mentioned who had been restricted. Yes. 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 I see. Well, yes, I think in, in every instance, uh, the most stunning of which, of course, is the uh, elimination of racial bars uh, on marriages to whites. Um, these racial bars were quite... Uh, they proliferated, um, they were quite various and as well as numerous, um, that the restrictions on marriage as they've been removed have tended to make the institution more appealing, more uh, uh, 
more clearly a, an equal right that people share. And so I would say that the removal of such restrictions has tended to strengthen the institution. And you, you mentioned um, that the cultural value that, is, that infuses the social meaning of marriage. Could you uh, explain to us what you mean by that and what the cult, how culture values marriage in, in the United States through its history? Yes, well, I'll, I'll just be brief because this is a huge subject. But first of all, I would say that the religious connotations that many different groups, different sects, and different religions have attached to marriage have been part of its high cultural valuation. Um, more than that, in, in, our, uh, in our entertainment, in our folk tales, in our songs, in our movies, um, at least since the rise of the novel in the 18th century, marriage has been the happy ending to the romance, to the conflict that may have transpired over the course of a story. Um, it, it is the um, principal happy ending in, in all of our romantic tales. And that kind of cultural um, polish on marriage has in the past century been greatly forwarded by advertising and other forms of visual imagery that surround us all the time and that present the rice, the, the white dress, the, um, the happy couple parading down the aisle as a, as a destination to be gained by any couple who, um, who love one another. So though th these cultural uh, attributes are probably too various to mention, but I'm sure you get my point. But let me ask you this. How does the, the cultural value and the, the meaning, social meaning of marriage, in your view, compare with the social meaning of domestic partnerships and civil unions? I uh, appreciate the fact that several states have extended, or maybe it's many states now, have extended the most of the material rights and benefits of marriage to um, people who have civil unions or domestic partnerships. But there really is no comparison in my historical view because there is nothing that is like marriage except marriage. And I would add that in that uh, halo around marriage, the cultural valuations have not been the only thing that has driven this, but rather the extent to which states have in the past century gone beyond, uh, uh, states and the federal government have gone beyond the basic freedom that marriage implies to add many, uh, many other benefits that are channeled through marriage. And while these uh, at least at the state level, are the material benefits that domestic partnership gives. The states um, choosing this institution named marriage through which to channel the benefits has itself added greater cultural valuation to the institution. In, uh, at, the, at the founding of the country, um, as, a, and as a historical matter, were there ever comparisons between marriage and democracy in the public discourse at the time? This, this is really a very interesting story. Yes, there have, there were. And what, what were the comparisons that were made at the time? Well, let me clarify, first of all, that, that it wasn't precisely democracy, but rather the form of Republican government that the Americans were founding. And their Republican form, this is small r, was a government based on consent and voluntary allegiance. This was as distinct from be being a subject of Great Britain. Um, Great Britain at the time did not call its, uh, its people its citizens, they were its subjects. And they were, had to be allegiant to the king just because they were born there. But in breaking away from Great Britain, uh, the founders of the American Republic were forming a government based on voluntary allegiance and consent, and that was very, uh, uh, very present in public discourse. 
And they found, um, and one sees this in newspapers and journals at the time, they found that the best analogy they could bring to this, um, to, to convince people that this was a good thing, to voluntarily consent to a stable relationship that may govern you, but it's for your own good, that the best uh, analogy they could find was marriage. And um, so in the popular periodicals of the time and in newspapers, the, that analogy was very, uh, very frequently made to persuade former subjects of Great Britain that they should consent to be governed as people consented to be governed by marriage laws, consent to be governed by this new institution to which they would give voluntary allegiance. But how much longer do you have with this witness? Your Honor, I probably have, um, I was about to move to another topic. I probably have another hour or so. Then this would probably be a good time to take uh, yes. our adjournment for the day. We're off to a good start, Council. I appreciate that very much. And uh, we'll begin tomorrow. Uh, can we begin at 8.30 instead of 9 o'clock? Is that agreeable to everybody? Yes, Your Honor. All right. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.30 then. Thank you. Thank you.